Thank you so much, musicians, for using your talents to honor Jesus. It's so wonderful to get to worship with you today, and what a privilege for me to be here today to share a message from our gracious God with you on this special day. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. If you haven't had a chance to meet me yet, or I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm Pastor Ben Kurth. I get to serve as the coordinating pastor on all of our Divine Savior Church campuses based in Doral, where I serve as a local pastor there. So I, I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Miami, Doral, Florida. So greetings to all of you. We're all celebrating with you in spirit, too. The theme I want to press into your hearts today, and especially especially for those of you that call this your ministry too here on this Divine Savior campus, is this thought that Jesus Christ, Jesus, reigns on this campus. There are two connected passages I want to dive into and a few others to tie together from God's Word. The first one as we get into things, is what the, uh, the Apostle Paul was inspired to write in Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 9, where he, he says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, my three daughters have never seen the mountains until about a month ago. My family and I, we got to take a trip to go and see my sister and her family who live in Montrose, Colorado on the western slope. They live at about a mile high and to get there we had to fly over the Rockies and it turns out just flying over the mountains is a majestic, amazing experience and I couldn't help in my window seat to think about how God reigns over all the earth, how even the tallest mountains must look small from a divine cosmic perspective way up high. From the ground, though, too, driving up into the mountains is pretty awesome, albeit a little bit scary for somebody like me who's gotten pretty used to living at sea level, (laughs) where in our town, like, the biggest hill is like an eight-foot incline on the golf course. If you go up and down with your bike, you you can feel a little bit of adrenaline, but not like this. Whoa, driving on the million-dollar highway and looking over the edge, that's pretty scary. Uh, We got to go to Telluride, which I had never heard of. I thought it was a Kia SUV up until this summer. (laughs) And we took a gondola ride up the mountain to the San Sofia station, and we walked out the They called it the Sea Forever Trail. And yeah, you can kind of see just about forever when you're up there. One of our favorite experiences, though, was in a, I guess, an old little mining town, not too far from Telluride. But on the 4th of July, when we were there, they had a Jeep parade at night, followed by the fireworks. And it was 
It was awesome because there's my family and some of my nephews, and we were watching the fireworks. They're, they're going off from up on the mountain. And you hear this echo, like, rolling behind you. It never ends almost. You see the flash of the fireworks in front, and you hear the crashing echo behind. It's, it was awesome. So why am I telling you about my family vacation? You might be wondering, right? Well, because the other Bible passage that I want to dig into today and apply here for all of you talks about going up upon the mountains with a message, a message to help people, in a sense, see forever, hear forever, and one day live forever with God. Here's that verse from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in chapter 52, verse 7. He writes, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. Your God reigns. So the Apostle Paul, if this sounds familiar, it's because you just heard him quote from Isaiah. A little part of this verse. Paul in the, the New Testament, Romans 10, quotes from Isaiah in the Old Testament. And in Romans 10, what we read at the beginning, Paul is, is writing about how people come to faith in Jesus. Like someone has to make the effort to share the message of Jesus with them has to take the time to teach them, has to proclaim to them the message. Paul says a faith comes from hearing the message. But we know it's not just any message. It's not a message of partisan politics, right? It's not a message about a political messiah, not just social media memes, not just TikTok News, TikTok tidings, if you will. Not just the power of positive thinking. It's not just even like, you know, good moral, you know, way to live with a little thin Christian veneer over the top. No, it's the message, Paul says, the message about Christ to the word about Christ. Here's the verse. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Well, let's not overcomplicate it. Why is this important? Because what he's saying is nobody by nature has faith in Jesus Christ. No one does. Believing that to be true is what motivated a dedicated, faith-filled group of Lutheran Christians some two decades ago, like Pastor Dan was saying, to buy a piece of property, which, as I've been told, was at the time pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Pastor Dave Bivens the other day was sharing stories with you, Pete, of walking out and seeing water moccasins and trapping boar and you know, all kinds of things. But it's believing this to be true that then led that same group to to kind of double down. In building that building, we can still see out the windows that building that served so well and will continue to serve well the school and the church and, and has for over a decade. But it's believing that to still be true that's led to now this new, beautiful, spacious campus. Nothing's changed except now the platform from which we get to share the gospel. Because it's never been here, never been, merely about teaching math and science and social studies and language arts and music and art and Fayette, all those things are great. It's never been merely to teach kids how to be kind and respectful and good Or now, too, how to get into a good college, the first graduating class coming up this year, and there's a college career center, and and we have high goals, right? It's never been just about that. 
but to proclaim the message about Christ. The message about a Savior who came to do what we could never do on our own to bring us spiritual life through his sacrifice into death for our sins so that spiritually dead people through the gospel message could be made alive and together with us be saved. This year's school theme, and I know some of you are going to hear and talk a lot about this, but you know it's Romans 5 verse 8. It goes like this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a powerful verse to take our stand on together. I mean, this is not, this is not some vague, wishy-washy kind of message, is it? Like, this is full-strength biblical Christianity right here in a nutshell. And, and I know in having a ribbon-cutting and a dedication, it's like you want everything to be perfect just from day one, right? And there's still some work to do. There's some baseboard, and there's some dust, and there's some screens, and there's some stuff but just think about this, right? You were maybe 98% done, but you went for it. You had a ribbon cutting. Today you have a dedication. Just think how wonderful it is that God didn't wait for us to clean up our act, our behavior before he sent Jesus to be our Savior. God did not wait for us to become lovable in his sight before he, he, de he determined to act on our, on our, to our best benefit what we could never do. I find great comfort in that, don't you? Jesus, God didn't wait for us to pass a theological exam or to have it all together to become worthy before he so determined to love each and every one of us that Jesus was willing to go to that cross he left behind the comfort of heaven, only to be lifted up there to die in our place for our sins. Every careless thought and, and harsh, cruel, mean word and every loveless deed, yours and mine. And, and that, that's how much he values you. That's how much he loves you. He loves me. So, what is it that we want to do here on this beautiful new campus. Let's see if I can get that to go. Oh, it's not, not clicking. Adam, can you come to my rescue? There it is. Thank you. What is it that we want to do in this beautiful new space on this beautiful, spacious campus? Well, we, we want everyone to, to see clearly, right, this message of the gospel. This good news about Jesus that saves and gives peace. Because it really does. Through Jesus' redemptive sacrifice, he's done everything to make us right with God. And so Jesus changes lives. That's not just our slogan. He changes attitudes. He changes people's perspectives. He changes families. He changes generations of families. I always think how blessed I am to be a part of a ministry like this because I truly believe that what we're doing is we're, we're changing uh, generations of people's lives with the gospel, which means changing people's eternities, eternities of families. And of course, God himself knows exactly the impact that we will have. But just think, Jesus who died for us while we were still sinners and couldn't really care less about that, he, he changes lives. And if he hasn't yet, he wants to change yours too. And, and we whose lives Jesus has changed cannot help then but today want to actually dedicate ourselves anew to this mission of proclaiming his saving name, pointing other people how it is that they too can be with us one day in heaven. And wow, what a platform 
that you all have now here on this campus to do that from. Again, here's what Isaiah says. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Your God reigns. (laughs) I do not have beautiful feet. In fact, I've got some of the most naturally ugly feet you could ever imagine. I got a little web toe thing that's probably TMI, right? (laughs) One of the funny things in my life is that my father, whom I love dearly, who lives 1,500 miles away from me, he, he shows me his love by sending me shoes. Like, he literally does this. I'll, be, I'll go home from, from the office, I'll go home from our campus, and I'll, I'll see a box on my doorstep, and if it's you know, wrapped in duct tape, I know it's from my dad. It's like, oh, my dad loves me, you know? And he gets a kick, I, I, I think, out of, like, imagining his son living in Miami, and so he buys me these, like, sometimes flashy shoes, and I'm like, when am I ever going to wear these, you know, and stuff like that. When I look at this, I got a closet full of these shoes, it's like, okay, my dad loves me, and he... He helps me cover my ugly feet. <laughs> but at the same time, especially this year, and I'll tell you why in just a minute, I, I've, I've grown to appreciate my feet more than ever. My, my feet enable me to walk, and, and walking is, is a blessing. I used to play basketball all the time. I pulled my calf. I'm, I'm having a hard time. But I, I'm walking, and walking is good, and Getting to climb up a mountain is good because when you get up on the mountain then you can see things like this, the vista from a distance. And I was so glad that my wife Sarah was able to, to do this hike with me because you see this year in March, she, she tore her Achilles tendon playing volleyball in the gym. So, you know, be careful that first time out in the new gym, okay? But four months later, with surgery and rehab and a lot of hard work, like, we didn't know if we'd even be able to do this trip to Colorado, but it was amazing. She was able to walk. We were able to hike. We were able to even climb up. And there were times where she had to kind of rest and put her foot in, like, you know, a cold mountain stream. And the rest of us or some others, my nephews, would would climb up the the steepest parts and, and things like that. But more than ever... Like, you know, she would see people when, when she was non-weight-bearing and couldn't walk. You know, we're driving along, and she, she'd see somebody running on the side, and she'd be like, check out his Achilles. <laughs> you know, it works. You know, our feet. Our feet are pretty cool because our feet get us going. And what is it here that makes anyone's feet, even naturally ugly feet like mine, what is it that makes them beautiful. Well, it's when my feet carry my body to any place, any platform, where I get to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how about you? What do your feet enable you to do? I was thinking about this, right? Like feet, you, they enable you to get out of bed. My, my dear father, I was just telling you about, he had a stroke last week and the left side of his body isn't working too well and he can't right now get out of bed and they're trying to teach him how to walk. So he's appreciating every step and we're hoping he gets his independence back, but we're not sure. Again, our feet are one of those things, right? They're, they're, they're pretty amazing. They carry us. They get us out of bed and, and what happens? Some, sometimes that's hard to do just to get out of bed, Right? In the middle of a school year, in the middle of a tough time, your feet swing out, they hit the floor, and what do you do? You, you go out the door, in your car, your truck, maybe on your bike even, some of you, and they make it pedal, or you push the gas pedal, and it, and it goes, and it, it goes to work. For many of you here, it's going to come here to this campus, and your feet are going to carry you out the door of your car and into that beautiful new entryway over here or maybe down there, and you're going to walk in a hallway, spacious and wide, and maybe some of you climb the stairs to get up to the STEM lab or even the the third floor. Your feet are going to carry you into a classroom or the, the weight room or the gym. And all what for? 
that you might find that student, that coworker, that parent over there to take a few more steps so that you can open your mouth and listen with your ears and speak a word of encouragement. Say, hey, how you doing? Everything okay? Can I help you find your way? How's your family? And in the context of all that, share an encouraging word, a, a verse from Scripture, something that brings them hope, maybe even a little prayer over there in the corner. Your feet take you to the classroom to lead the Christ light lesson or the chapel talk or to preach the gospel from this platform here so that the gospel of Jesus itself makes it way, its way onto every square foot of this spacious campus, wherever your feet can carry you, so that in fact what you get to say is this, your God reigns. Your God reigns. Now I want to jump into the context of this passage a little bit. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, he, he lived hundreds of years before Jesus was born. But for God's Old Testament people, the, the Jewish people who, who heard this message, they, they needed to be reminded of this. They needed to be reassured of this because it, it sure didn't look or feel like it. You see, the, the kingdom of Babylon had come and, and destroyed their nation, had, had destroyed their, their city. Zion, where the temple of the Lord was, it was reduced to rubble. Most of the people were carried off into exile, and it, and it didn't look like there was too much to be excited about. Nobody was preparing and planning for the next year at the Hebrew Academy in Jerusalem. It didn't even look anymore like God was reigning on his throne. Until a message rang out from the mountains to say, Babylon has fallen. And as that message echoed out into the ears of God's beleaguered people, what happened? It, it, it changed their lives. To those who received it, it led them to return home, to, to rebuild the temple. It led to the, the revival of, of, of the faith of a nation. And for us, what did that mean? It meant the coming of Jesus, the coming of our Savior. It meant that one day God would keep his promise after all and in spite of everything that had happened. He was still in control. God still reigned on his throne. Because God kept that promise, what now do we have except everything to look forward to, everything under his care? And so this now becomes our message, your message too, to share with the students and the families and all the people who come here to be able to say to them, Jesus reigns on this campus. Jesus, who conquered the grave, reigns as king over all. So as we come to the end here, I've just got three quick points to try and make this practical a little bit for you. The first point, Jesus is in control in the midst of chaos. You experienced some chaos in getting to this point, I know. Hurricane Barrel was not something anybody planned for and hoped for, not so close to dedication and everything. It, it messed up the construction schedule. It caused a lot of your plans to just be thrown into, into chaos. On the hearts and minds of a lot of people is just the seeming, the feeling of like a chaotic political situation right now, Right? There's this like saturation of anger and, and frustration kind of simmering out there. People have many fears, many creeping anxieties. Young people today as anxious as ever, and there's so many things that seem uncertain in life, right? And maybe I'm thinking some of you, some of you teachers perhaps feel that way too right now. 
just from the standpoint of maybe you're new here and you're trying to figure this all out, you want to get your classroom ready, but the time is short. You've been all hands on deck working for a couple of weeks now, and you've got all this stuff yet to do. Maybe a new grade that you're teaching, new curriculum that you're using. Some of you, the first year of ministry, and that's a lot. But remember, Jesus is in control in the midst of chaos. I needed to be reminded of this, too, a couple of weeks ago, and it was kind of cool the way that I was reminded was listening to a sermon by a young man named Juan David Escobar. He's a graduate of Divine Savior Academy in Doral, and now he's at our seminary studying to be a pastor, and he came to preach for us and preached on the very same text that I got to preach on for my first sermon long ago, the, the story of Jesus calming the storm. That Jesus, it was his idea in the first place to go with his disciples into the boat to take them through the storm. He was in control the whole time. And he's the one who got them safely to the other side. His word that still speaks peace to our hearts. Jesus is in control in the midst of chaos. The second thing, Jesus reigns for the good of his church. Sometimes it maybe doesn't look like it. Sometimes it maybe doesn't feel like it. Some days it sometimes seems like the devil's winning out there in the world. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's days when it's going to feel like that on this campus too. Because just think, do you think the devil is happy for one second that all this has now been, been dedicated to the glory of God, a place where a Christian worldview is going to be taught in the classroom every day, where the pure gospel of Jesus is going to be preached every week, every day, in so many different ways, where a harvest strategy is going to be implemented by a bunch of teammates who are on mission together for the same purpose with one heart and mind. Do you think the devil's happy about that? No way. No way. And so sometimes you're going you're gonna to hear kids say things, they're going to do things, and you're going to be reminded there's, there's a sinful nature that we all have too, and don't forget, Jesus reigns for the good of his church. He's always doing more behind the scenes than we can ever see from our vantage point. The last point is this, Jesus reigns as our king who's conquered death. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, for, for he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That even death one day will be undone when our divine Savior, Jesus, returns. And so here's Paul's encouragement and my encouragement to you. He, he writes, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Today, this afternoon, of course, is the closing ceremony of the Olympics. And I love the Olympics, but it's interesting, right? Like, you can always tell in the Olympics who the winners are, right? They're the ones with the gold medals around their neck, standing on the podium, singing their national anthem. But have you ever thought, like, if you're the eighth place finisher, like, in the 100-meter dash or something, like, do you feel like a loser? Like, are you a failure? And it's so, so interesting, right? Like these people, they dedicate everything for this. All the sacrifices they've made, all the training, all the time, all the energy, all the effort. Do they ever wonder, you think, is it, is it all worth it? I've been in ministry long enough to know that there are days when each of us, in one way, shape, or form, is tempted to ask that question. Is it worth it? 
After all these years, after all this time, after all this effort, after all these sacrifices, is it worth it to keep on going? To not even know sometimes if I'm winning or not, is it worth it? It looks like others are getting the gold medals and I keep on striving, but I've never stood on the podium. Is it worth it? I just want to say, friends, it is always worth it for a believer in Jesus who gives us the victory. And so today, as the Olympics ends, your ministry here in this building that we dedicate today, a new season really begins in this place. And in all your vocations, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you serve here or elsewhere or out there in this community, Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The gospel seeds that you plant here will one day bear fruit there in eternity where together with all those who will come yet to believe in Jesus as their Savior, you will join in that never-ending anthem of God's praise To him who gives a prize far greater than a gold medal. So finally, as I look around and as I've been blessed to walk around on this this beautiful campus, I, I just stand amazed at God. It's a beautiful campus. And... In particular, maybe I'm a little biased as a pastor, I think this is a beautiful worship space and it's going to be an incredible blessing to Divine Savior Church here for you to have this space. I'm so excited for you. But I can also say, as I look around this room, I see some beautiful feet. Nice boots, Dan. (laughs) So now it's time to use them. All these buildings, these beautiful buildings, and all your feet. May they carry you into every square foot of this campus so that you can share that even more beautiful message of God's love in Jesus Christ. And say to people, your God reigns. Jesus reigns on this campus. Amen.